Okay. Uh, well, before we jump in, um, I want to take a quick moment to thank uh, Joe Bagley, the Boston City archaeologist, for joining us tonight. Um, and apologies for our technical issues, Joe and, and everyone else. Um, and I just want to very quickly um, introduce Joe. So... Joe Bagley joined the city archaeology program in 2011 as the fourth city archaeologist since 1983. Bagley curates a growing repository of archaeological collections currently housed at the City Archaeology Laboratory at 201 Rivermore Street um, in West Roxbury, acts as the review and compliance agent for below-ground cultural resources in the city, educates the public in archaeology through a number of city programs, manages Rainsford Island, and manages the archaeology program's social media platforms. Joe received his bachelor's degree in archaeology from Boston University and a master's degree in historical archaeology from UMass Boston. While a senior at BU, he worked at the City Archaeology Lab under the previous city archaeologist, Ellen Birkelin, to analyze the Native American artifacts ex excavated by former city archaeologist Stephen Pendry on Boston Common. Joe has conducted archaeological surveys from the woods of Maine to the Florida Everglades. He specializes in both Native American and historical archaeological analysis and the archaeology of Boston. In 2016, he was awarded the John L. Cotter Award from the Society for Historical Archaeology for Early Career Achievements. He lives in the Lower Mills neighborhood of Dorchester with his wife, Jen. So thanks again for being here, Joe, and I will hand it over to you. Sounds great. Thanks so much. So I'll do a bit of a slow start just to make sure everybody has as much chance as possible to get into the room. Um, I just want to confirm uh, that you all can see my, just my screen, my full screen. Okay, awesome. One thing's going well. <laughs> okay, so um, so yeah, so I'm going to talk about an archaeology, and I try to be clear that it's not the archaeology because the next person who comes along may interpret it entirely different, but. Um, but we're going to be talking tonight about Shirley Place, and um, thank you to everybody that stuck around and uh, for the folks that are coming in um, as literally as we speak, and um, hopefully someday for some folks who are going to be watching this on YouTube. So the talk tonight is really about two separate properties, the first one being Shirley Eustace House or Shirley Place, but the other one is 4244 Shirley Street, which has kind of lived in the, uh, the history of the neighborhood for, for centuries. Um, through oral history and is now becoming fully and full, uh, fully unfolded into the Shirley Place landscape history um, and story of this place. So I think it's really important to talk about the setting of Shirley Place. The the in archaeology we talk about it's not just the stuff; it's about the story. And so much of that story is where the stuff is found or where the stuff was. And so um, this etching from around 1775, I think, is really an excellent uh, reminder of what Roxbury was in the early, um, in the 18th century and even before that, and really, really well into the late, um, into the early to mid 19th century. It was a very rural space. Uh, this is the area that's essentially on the border between the Roxbury neighborhood and the Dorchester neighborhood, which at the time were two separate towns. Um, and this was a really massive house in the state that was located uh, quite prominently in the landscape, but it was also situated directly on the shoreline, which is really going to play a major role in uh, some of the earliest history of this property. So the um, these two maps, I think, really show some of the development of the city and the area around Roxbury. Um, my beginning of my talk is really going to focus in on the history of the property, and then we'll kind of dive into the archaeology from there. Um, you can see on the left map that the property is located kind of on the edge of a wetland, low-lying area um, near near some highlands, um, facing what was South Bay, which is essentially now the South Bay Shopping District, which was filled in the early 1900s. And you can see in the map on the right just how far from the water is now currently located. But for most of the history of this place, it was really a coastal site overlooking uh, water. And it would have been probably more accessible via water than even land going back to the 1700s, 1800s. Uh, this is a bit of a confusing map, but I'll kind of walk you through it. So what this is, is a LIDAR image. And this is essentially a laser scan of um, the property around Shirley Place from space. What it does is essentially it erases the buildings from the landscape. And you can definitely still see the 
um, the streetscape uh, carved into the landscape. But if you kind of squint your eyes a little bit, what you're going to see is on the left side of the map, kind of a highland area. Um, and on the right side of the map, um, you're going to see um, it kind of drops off pretty dramatically into a lower flat area. And what that really is, is the... Um, is the shoreline of the original, not the original shoreline, but one of the edges of the, the land form of Boston dropping down into the ocean. And this is really important for the for the native uh, history of this property, the Massachusetts history of this property, because essentially what it is, it's a high and dry location overlooking South Bay, which would have been an excellent place for clamming and things like that. Um, and as I go through the archeology span of the site, you'll see how this uh, proximity to the shoreline and to that low lying area, but also on its high slope really plays into why we find native creations on the site um, in while doing archeology span there. Oops. Can I just confirm, Susie, if I move my mouse around on the screen, can you see yes. that now? Excellent, mm -hmm. cool. Now I can actually point things out. <laughs> so um, Europeans arrived around 1630. We didn't know some folks were here a little bit earlier from Europe, but um, really the bulk of the original uh, European settlers arrived around 1630. John Winthrop's fleet came down to Salem from Europe um, as part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and kind of dispersed amongst um, the Boston uh, Harbor area, settling six towns, including one of them being Roxbury. Um, so it was a small group of, of settlers that came to Roxbury and began um, allotting lots of land that was traditionally Massachusetts land to themselves. Um, we don't know the exact earliest history of the 1630 and 40s of the property, but we know that by 1650, the property was owned by Abraham Newell. Um, and he arrived in 1634 and received a very, a very large allotment, possibly this property as well. It was located on the edge of town, really on the, um, the border of town uh, with Dorchester Brook, which you can't see in this image, or actually you can see just a little bit to the right. Um, Dorchester Brook coming in from the right, very edge of the map um, or of the drawing. That brook ran just south of the property and um, defined the edges of Dorchester and Roxbury at the time. So uh, Abraham Newell is the first person we have documented owning property in the area. In, in 1672, Nathan Holmes purchased 53 acres of land from several owners, including Abraham Newell, and we're confident that at that point, uh, Holmes had purchased lots uh, of land that included this property because it's specifically mentioning the edges of Dorchester Brook, which is so close to the property that we're confident that's when it is. And Holmes later uh, sells the property in 1700 to a man named Peter Allen, um, and he's the person who we are absolutely certain from the deed books um, is owning the specific property upon which the building is this, um, standing, although we're pretty confident everybody before that did as well, but Peter Allen is the one that has it conclusively in the ownership. Um, at that point, when Peter Allen owned it, there was a lot of about nine acres surrounded by multiple other lots that abutted the same lots. So it was kind of broken up into, into land, but would have essentially been experienced as one large estate. And one of the major parts that it had um, included in many of the deeds um, going all the way into the 19th century is the mention of the town clay pit. So what is the town clay pit? So this map from, I think it's about 1855 or 52, I have it again at a later time um, where it's actually mentioned um, with the date, uh, shows the clay pit. So this is the Eustace Place estate in the middle of the map. Um, and just north and west of the property is this kind of pit essentially. And the town clay pit was an area where settlers had found access to rock clay, which would then be used for making bricks um, and uh, pottery in some cases, but really the main um, goal was to uh, excavate the clay, form them into bricks, and then be able to make um, brick structures. Uh, the key is really the brick chimneys, because most people were making their houses out of wood at this time. Um, and Peter Allen was a brick layer. We don't have a record of him being a brick maker, which would have been a separate job, possibly. Um, but we're pretty confident from that information that Peter Allen's interest in the property was more about the clay pit than it was about the high hill, although that didn't hurt. Um, but we know Allen also had a house on the property, so he probably built his house close to the clay pit in all likelihood at the site of the um, Eustace place because it was on the highest knoll and... Um, people tend to live on the highest point in the land.
Alan died in 1728 and the property passed first to his son and then pretty quickly his son sold it to a man named Samuel Waldo. Samuel Waldo owned the property for about 20 years, um, but we're not 100% confident that he even saw the land. Um, in many ways, Waldo was um, living and occupying in uh, the area of Maine. I believe Waldo County may be named after Samuel Waldo, but don't quote me on that because I'm not certain. Um, but during that 20 years, he also bought up lots of land in New Hampshire and Maine um, and was essentially a land speculator. He also was a brigadier general during the siege of Louisburg in Nova Scotia in 1745. And that's where he actually met and befriended William Shirley, who had traveled up to the front lines of Louisburg uh, while the governor of Massachusetts to really rally the troops. So we think that's where William Shirley kind of got the connection to the property uh, in the historic records. And ultimately it passed from, um, from where's my notes, Mr. Waldo to Mr. Shirley in 16, 1746 which you can see here in this deed. Um, the early history of this property is not exactly uh, full of visual interest. So sorry about the old documents, but at least you can look at some pretty handwriting in the meantime. Um, so in the time in 1746, the property was sold with a house on it. So we're very confident that the Shirley Place uh, mansion is not the original house on the property, but is in fact a second house, possibly a third house, because it may be that Alan built a second house himself we're not 100 percent certain on that but it's at least the second house on the property and um, governor shirley pretty much immediately demolished the existing house on the property and started to build his new mansion house which we know of today as shirley place it's not the best photo of the building um, there's many more grander photos however this is the only photo the best photo really of Shirley Place in its original location so i'm going to use this for when i'm talking about shirley place prior to the move um, just for everybody that's kind of coming in, I'm, I'm explaining kind of the broad history of the property because you kind of need to know the outline of the history before we dive into the archaeology of it because it kind of places the stuff into the context. So Governor Shirley became uh, governor of Massachusetts, royal governor of Massachusetts in 1741. So he'd already been governor for about four or five years before he bought the property. He began uh, working on the house soon after buying it and finished sometime between 1747 and 1749. The building itself is massive by anyone's standards. Uh, it has a massive uh, central um, uh, turret-like structure on the top. Um, it also has a grand entrance and staircases facing both the west and the east. So from the west, you would enter the property from the land and you would have this grand facade, the view that you see here. Um, and then also from the east, when you would both see the property from the sea and approach it from the sea, you would have an almost identical view with a slightly different entrance facing in that direction. So it really has two front doors and for all intents and purposes. Um, another thing that we're gonna come back to, so please remember this, uh, there's a really important structure on the ends of the property called a piazza, which is really just a fancy name for saying a covered porch with a basement. Um, this is gonna play a major role in some of our interpretation of the archeology span of the house, but you can see how the foundations of the building itself actually extends out beyond the footprint of the main house under the piazza, and then the piazza itself is built on top of that. So you would have had a covered space to exit the house onto a, um, essentially a porch, and uh, but not on the second floor. Um, and below that, a full basement. So um, when we're digging on archaeological sites, we typically will find uh, cellars and basements as holes in the ground. But you can see in this image, it's pretty clear that the basement itself is not actually that subterranean. It's really just a slightly submerged area in the ground with the house built on top of it. And this is for a couple of reasons. One, it allowed for staff, including many, many enslaved people, to enter into the building directly from the outside without having to go through first floor building, uh, first floor entrances. Um, it also allowed for the house to be physically higher um, in the landscape. And, and certainly this house was made to impress um, in all ways. And so building it up on top of essentially stilts just made it bigger and grander. So that was certainly part of the motivations for building on top of the property. But that daylight basement also made for um, extremely functional space on the basement level for the enslaved servants that lived in the property when it was first built. So the property itself is primarily a summer home. Um, we know of several people that were living on the property itself when it was first occupied. Uh, there was Governor Shirley, his wife, Frances. Um, uh, uh, William and Frances had five sons and five daughters, but only two of the sons and three of the daughters survived infancy. 
And it's a little bit difficult to tell from the historic records, but essentially we only really know of one child that would have been born around the time of the completion of the house, who was definitely living in the house. Um, but most of the daughters and the sons were in their um, 20s around the time that the house was complete. So I'm sure Shirley, uh, Susie can correct me, but we're not, um, there's not a lot of evidence of the older children living in the house itself. Um, however, one of the daughters, Elizabeth, married a man named Eliakim Hutchinson, who's a Boston judge, um, who will, he'll be coming back um, as part of the story in a second. So in 1764, Governor Shirley left the estate and sold it to Eliakim. So then it passed down to his daughter, um, to Governor Shirley's daughter, Elizabeth, and they owned the property from 1764 until 1775, when two things kind of happened at the same time. The war started, which created chaos amongst the family because they were loyalists and they had to flee, but also Eliakim himself died in the same time um, in June of 1775. Uh, what that meant was that um, Eliakim's wife, uh, Elizabeth, fled as a loyalist from the property, abandoning it, essentially, leaving behind one of their enslaved people, Thomas Scipio, um, and the property was then taken over. I'm going to pause for a second to recognize the enslaved people that we've been mentioning a couple times so far. So we know of um, quite a few people that lived in the property, but also um, were enslaved by the Shirleys and Hutchinsons both before and after their occupation in the house. So the folks at the Shirley uh, Eustis House have done a great job um, documenting these folks, and this is directly from their website. So we know of Jack, Jane, Nanny, David, Thomas Scipio, a woman who's not had to not have her name recorded, Caesar, Affy, and Chloe. Um, of these folks, um, we're confident that Jane, who was baptized in 1746, right around the time that the property was finished, um, was likely to have lived in the house for as long as she was alive. Um, and she may have died at a young age. We're not completely certain of her of her whereabouts after her baptism, because unfortunately enslaved people are very poorly documented. Um, this is a quote taken from Abid Ali by, um, Ali by about um, Jane's life. And it's I think it just captures um, kind of some of the the, the violence of, of enslavement, especially for young people. So Jane was likely torn from her parents, either given away to Shirley for free by an owner who viewed her as an economic burden or given to him as a gift. Enslaved children in New England, in the words of Massachusetts Historical Society founder Jeremy Belknap, quote, were given away like puppies. And just to kind of drive that point home, here's a period um, advertisement in 1765 giving away a, a young black girl. Um, it was not uncommon for black girls, especially to be given away um, as, and they were seen essentially as um, burdens to the to the enslavers uh, for much of their young adult, or for much of their young life. The um, boy children um, were often uh, sold um, and not given away, um, but either way, children uh, were essentially another mouth to be fed in the households of enslaved people. Um, other folks that we know of in the house uh, were Thomas Scipio, Caesar, Affy, and their mother, and most likely very many others. And I'll talk more about who the others may be in a second. So Thomas Scipio was one of the people that was actually um, stayed back after um, uh, the Hutchinsons fled. And he was there when the property was taken over by the um the american forces the the uh, rebels um but he was ultimately sold to john powell uh as a as, as remaining enslaved to ludlow massachusetts we know caesar affy and their mother were listed in the 1775 probate of um Eliakim hutchinson and it's likely that they lived in the property as well and it's even possible that their mother may have been jane who was baptized by um, Eliakim's wife's mother, so his mother-in-law. Um, we're not certain about that, um, but it's certainly possible. Um, another little piece of the puzzle that I was seeing while researching for this talk was that um, Eliakim Hutchinson and, um, and Elizabeth, their first daughter, married into the Apthorpe family, who um, became an Apthorpe, um, but she would have been uh, joining a family of the essentially the number two enslavers in the in the uh, Commonwealth, uh, right behind Peter Faneuil, and there's a, a Caesar and um, that was enslaved in the Apthorpe family, which the dates don't quite align. I was wondering if that actually might have been that 
after the Hutchinsons fled, perhaps the enslaved people moved into the Hutt the Apthorpe family, but I can't I can't prove that. So during the war, the house was confiscated and was used for many purposes, including barracks, headquarters, and a hospital. So it went essentially from a summer playhouse to a barracks, a headquarters, and a hospital. That was a relatively brief period. And then it enters into the 19th century um, after that, when many owners owned the property. I'm not going to get into huge details on everybody, but a significant owner is William and Caroline Eustace, who um, owned the property. They were noted abolitionists. William was the governor. Um, and they they took over the property, making it the only house, at least in Massachusetts, it might be in the country that is owned by both a colonial, I'm sorry, um, a royal governor and an elected governor, um, the same house, which is why it has the name Shirley Eustace House. Um, William passed away and um, pretty soon after they purchased the property and then Caroline took over the ownership of the property. And I think it was really an under undertold story of Caroline's ownership just because she was the longest owner of the property. She was living and owned the property from 1825 to 1867. So over 50 years, I'm sorry, over 40 years, she lived in the property, um, took care of it, and also ensured that it um, it maintained itself. It was a massive property that took a lot of labor to continue. Um, and she did a lot of good things for the community, but also fortunately um, was a leading or a noted abolitionist in the community. When she passed away in 1867, the Eustace family took ownership of it, um, but it was essentially a lot of land in a neighborhood that was rapidly transforming from these rural grand estates to an industrial immigrant neighborhood. Um, and at that point, they saw the value of the property less than this massive mansion with a lot of land around it that they weren't able to take care of because they didn't live there, the family, the descendants. And so what they saw the next best, prop, uh, next best option for the property was to divide it. So it's a little bit of a fuzzy image, but this is from an 1867 plan of the Eustace estate, 15 acres of land, and you can still see the, the clay pit on the little pond on the left side of the map. What they did is they laid out a series of streets in a partial grid. They broke up the lot into 53 individual house lots and then began to sell off those lots to developers. The, unfortunately, this also meant that Shirley Street, which is the street laid out in this plan that is the street still present next to the property went through the house. And that's really the most of the news went through the house. The exact details of how it went through the house, we're not certain. Um, so the property was at risk of being demolished because it was in the way. Fortunately, the owners of the um, property, the developers really picked up the house and moved it to two nearby lots, filling two lots and um, essentially treated the property like a large apartment building. The rest of the property was rented. I was, um, the rest of the properties in this map were sold off for individual buildings. And this is a map from 1933, almost 60 years after when that uh, original plan was drawn to show you just how infilled the property became. So at its peak, there were 23 other structures within the Shirley Eustace property. They likely contained dozens of apartments, hundreds of people likely lived in this neighborhood, this kind of mini neighborhood that popped up when the property was sold and developed. Um, but uh, today, um, it's not experienced quite like this because in the um, in the early 1900s, the property owners, which at that point in 1913 was the Shirley Place, um, which is still, sorry, uh, original, uh, the property was purchased to turn it into essentially a historic property um, and more of a house museum. And over the next couple of decades, the lots surrounding the property were purchased and then the buildings on those lots were demolished to create an open space essentially recreating some of the original um, rural landscape that would have originally been surrounding the property, although the house now is slightly differently located than it would have been at the time. Jumping back just a little bit, the first leases of the house, um, which is one of my favorite stories about this property, were the House of the Good Shepherd. So they were a convent group, um, a Catholic convent group, dedicated to the Refor reformation of prostitutes and, quote, wayward and, and, and fallen women. Um, these were women that were brought to the property um, as part of the nuns' kind of outreach, and um, they, were, they were referred to as inmates and then kept under constant labor, including sewing and tailoring, to keep them busy and also train them in some 
marketable skills in the late 1800s. Um, they were briefly occupying the property from about 1868 to 1871, which very helpfully put them in the census record, which we'll see in a second. Um, but then they moved on to a new purpose-built property in Roxbury. And here in 1870, the U.S. Census shows um, the ladies who were living in the property. You have Carolyn Ann, I'm sorry, Ann Carlton and Bridget Stokes, who were essentially um, managing the property. And then the list of the women down below. Um, we know from later records of the new property that they built and moved into that it was approximately half and half between Catholic nuns and the quote unquote fallen women living together in the property. But the census here doesn't exactly differentiate between who were the former prostitutes and who were the nuns. Um, but amongst these women, uh, you would have had both. Um, but notice that the 1860s, uh, sorry, the 1870 census also indicates quite clearly the, um, the uh, ethnic makeup of Roxbury at the time, which was predominantly, almost exclusively Irish immigrants coming to America following the Industrial Revolution when Roxbury really became an industrial neighborhood around Stony Brook. And almost everybody, not almost everybody, everybody on this list is either a born in Ireland or is a first generation New Englander of Irish origin. After the Good Shepherd left, it became a rental property and the house was broken up into multiple apartment buildings, apartment um, rooms and, and uh, rented out. This is a late 19th century image showing a group of girls sitting on the east steps of the house. And you can see also there's some children up in the window and the small shed-like structure below the stairs, which may or may not be a privy. And we're not going to dwell too much on that because I don't I want to really focus on the 18th century, but that's also a piece of the property that I'm interested in archaeologically. This um, chart shows the uh, population of the house. And I think this is important because um, this is counting the census every 10 years. You can see in the late 1700s and early 1800s, the occupation of the property by the Eustace family. And then upon Eustace, uh, William Eustace's death, the property became much less occupied uh, year round, uh, not year round, um, much less occupied by folks in the prop in the house um, when the property began to uh, decrease its need for agriculture and became more of a large home. Um, what you see in the 1790s map, sorry, in the 1790s component of the chart is about 10 people. And this would have been a time when um, the property was an active agricultural pursuit needing to grow food in order to support the people in the house. And it goes up to above 15 people by 1800. And this gives you a really good idea of how many people would have been in the property in the 18th century um, in order to keep this place functioning, because you had the the three or four people that actually lived in the house that owned it, and then everybody around them supporting the lives of the people that were living in the house who were rich, extremely rich, and very well connected, um, both uh, feeding, cleaning, preparing for events, um, taking care of the property itself, repairing the property, driving individuals around the property and out and uh, to and from the property. You would have also had a large uh, agricultural estate. At this point, this is about a 30 acre property that would have been growing food for both the people living in the property, but also um, essentially keeping an open space that would have been actively used for profit um, by the things that were being grown and sold. So there was a large need for people on this property. And even though we only know of three or four people that we know, that are documented as being enslaved in the property, it is likely that there's at least seven plus people um, that are essentially invisible in the historic record that were likely living on the property, working on the property, and most likely enslaved by the family that was there. They just don't turn up in the records. So that's where we come in for the archaeology side of things. So today the property is a house museum. And in 2018, uh, we were approached about the area to the northeast of the house, which was in need of improvements. So you can see the Shirley Place and that red kind of block marks an area that we were asked to take a look at archaeologically. Here's what the property looked like, or that component, that red area looked like in 2018. You can see the, the stones on the ground are really uneven. Um, essentially, the, the needs were to be able to cross that space without tripping, which was a um, tall order because of the stones that were there. Um, so what they wanted to do is to lift the stones, 
fix the sand underneath the stones and then replace them. But we had talked about the need for potential archaeology there. Given that the property has such a shallow basement, we weren't sure if if even going down a few inches could potentially disturb the former basement of the existing house. Um, there's been a longstanding um, legacy of where exactly the property was located prior to being moved. And you can see in this um, hypothesized uh, area of where the house was, the former house would have been located in Shirley Street, um, but the, the western half of it, the northern half of it, um, and the southern half of it very thoroughly being in this kind of paved stone area that was going to be restored. Um, the idea was that the property was picked up and moved 60 feet from its former location with a near overlap of one component of the corner of the house. That was what we believed in 2018. So we entered the property with that in mind. Oh, and um, the other reason why we really thought it was significant was that uh, the basement had some really good records that indicated where people would have been um, not just living, but also uh, working. And so you can see in this image, it's a little bit crowded with text, apologize. But on the far left side, there's a bedroom for a man and a housekeeper's sitting room, which likely would have been um, enslaved people's housing uh, in the 18th century if that function continued. Um, back uh, to the 18th century. There was two very large um, fireplaces. You can see those kind of in those rectangles on either side of the house, so a summer kitchen and a winter kitchen. The biggest difference was that the summer kitchen was that property that or that window you could see in the 1860s um, view, which would have allowed you to open the windows and let the heat out, whereas the winter kitchen was a little bit more subterranean, which would have helped keep the heat into the property, which folks working down there needed badly. Um, there's also many sellers for various fruit products, vegetable products, wine products, and there's even stories of one of the, fruit, I believe it was the wine cellar being used as a dungeon back in the day. Um, Either way, this is a hotbed of use of the property for the enslaved people that would have been living in the property, working in the property. We would have had their personal space in their bedrooms and also their workspace in the kitchens, especially. This is where the drawing kind of comes from. There's a, a historic kind of record of what the property looked like above, a much more simplified version of it below. So it's more or less the same map you just saw, but um, a, a series of storage rooms on the on the northern end of the property, really the eastern end of the property, what amounts to a large hallway down the middle. It's kind of hard to envision how that would have been experienced, but it was a large open space in the middle of the property um, abutting the chimney spaces and then the kitchens on the kind of west-southwest corner or edge of the house facing the road. So with that in mind, we looked at the um, potential for archaeology in that par parcel, that part of the property by doing a series of trenches. So you can see on the lower map, um, there's a, this is the outline of the building. I should use more grays. Um, this is the building itself. This is the kind of uh, paved area. We did a series of trenches kind of scattered throughout that area to try to see if we could find any evidence of the basement of the house. But what we really wanted to do was find both the basement floor and the edge of the foundation, because from that we could read, we could kind of extrapolate outwards to other parts of the property. Um, we also were really interested in ensuring that the local neighborhood kids were able to come out to see the dig. Um, we set up a really amazing uh, travel lab into the carriage house. Um, we had a great groups of kids coming out to the property. Sarah, who's in the middle of the photo on the right, had a beautiful uh, mobile lab set up in the in the. Uh, carriage house, but unfortunately, we basically didn't find anything. Um, so the the main trench, um, sorry, uh, in the area under the steps, uh, we took a look at that that shed structure, which you can see underneath the girls on the stairs. Just because we, I thought it might have been a privy. I wasn't quite sure. It's obviously a door into it, which could have been a storage shed. But in the 1860s, there was no running water on the property, so they would have had to have an outhouse somewhere. And the way all the drawings and the photographs show this property, there's really not a spot kind of in the distance beside the house or in the distance of the house where an outhouse would have obviously gone. So my thought was that this little kind of shed could have been the outhouse for the entire property. So we put a trench across that area. This is a little bit hard to kind of visualize where we are, but I'm on top of the steps looking down at the ground beneath the steps. Um, and on the left, that kind of pebbly area is a is a drip line for the rain. And then on the right side of the image, um, sorry, the right image shows the same excavation area down about a foot and a half deep. And what you can see in this area here is a stone wall 
coming out from the side of the, the uh, stairs, which we were absolutely expecting going back. That was essentially this wall here that had just been cut off at the top when they got rid of this shed because it's very much not there today. And this was the area that we were really interested in because if this was the privy, then this would have been the vault of the privy, the place where the poo and all this trash, hopefully, that they threw in the outhouse would have gone. Um, so we excavated, focusing mainly on the inside of that structure. Here's another photograph of us excavating from above during the process. And on the left image, you can see a photograph when we stopped digging. And on the right, you can see um, the drawing version of that. So essentially what we were able to find is that there was a lot of fill on one side of the proper on one side of the wall, which is actually on the outside of the wall. And on the inside of the wall, we weren't able to go that far down into, but we started to find layers of fill. Um, and what that indicated to us was that there was a deeper portion of that property of that feature that had been filled up somewhat. Um, I'm interpreting that to mean the potential for the privy is there, but the part of what we wanted to do for this project and the 4244 dig was we wanted to document the presence of something, but not necessarily blast it open with a hole um, and dig through it all in these little trenches. We wanted to open it up and that would have been a larger survey, which we were not doing at that fate time. So really our goal was to document the presence of important features and then potentially come back to do a bigger dig, a much more concentrated dig on the most uh, important parts. But to be honest, the other thing is that this portion of the property is not under a great threat of change. And so the best thing we can do for it is to just leave it alone, because the best thing you can do for any archaeological site is to leave it alone. And so for now, it's going to stay untouched unless something like a repair to the foundation needs to be done or other excavations are needed in this area. We know that it could be the privy. We don't know for certain that it is the privy, but for now, it's best just to leave it there. Artifact-wise, there wasn't a lot there. So we excavated over the course of 11 days. We found just over 2,000 artifacts. A third of those were architectural, so glass, brick, nails, not very exciting. Um, 2,000 sounds like a lot of things, but on a site this big, uh, downtown, for instance, we would have easily pulled out 10, 15,000 artifacts. It's really not a lot of stuff. Um, we did find an amazing assemblage of 19... 50s clothespins, which were not terribly significant. Um, we found every color that they made, and I believe that this was a major portion, a major area where they did all their clothes hanging. Uh, we also found a good preservation of animal bone. This is a, probably a chicken bone or chicken thigh bone um, of a small animal um, at the very least, and uh, that was inside of the privy vault or potential privy vault, and that's one of the reasons why we stopped excavating there was because we started to find more things, and ironically, when you're not digging in the in a more concentrated area with the, the right, we're just doing these kind of test trenches and not kind of uh, a more thorough testing. When you start hitting uh, an important deposit with a test trench, you stop because you want to open up the area much larger. And that wasn't part of the phase of the work that we were doing. Back in the um, main portion of the area with the cobbles, um, we excavated this really long trench. I think it's four, four or five meters long. This is a pretty, pretty big trench for us. Um, although we did bigger ones in 42, 44. Uh, my team did an amazing job moving these incredibly heavy stones with uh, simple levers. Uh, we learned a lot of uh, techniques on Nova and put them all to use. You can see here in this photo, we had just excavated out the sand that was essentially the underlayment of the stone. And we're just getting into that first deposit. And we were really concerned that the basement of the house could be just under the surface. So we're taking it very carefully at this point. However, we dug through um, some really nasty soil. So what you can see in this image is um, the really nice sand that goes across the uh, pit where the, uh, which was essentially the underlayment for the stone. And then immediately you get this rocky, rocky, rocky soil that has a slightly greenish tinge, this olive color. As soon as we hit that rocky soil, we found nothing. And I truly mean nothing, not a single artifact. So I was really hoping that this would have been fill on top of something really important. So I made my poor team keep digging and digging and digging. And this is extremely compact, clay ridden. And then eventually we said, no, we need to not dig down the whole thing. Let's just dig a test pit in the middle of it. So we sunk this test pit on, um, on one area of the property and it just kept going. And towards the bottom, we started to get, um, I call it banding, but essentially it's, it's layers of sand and silt and sand and silt. 
And you don't get that when someone's filling an area. You get that when there's a glacier sitting on top of a property, letting go of, of silt and sand over many, many hundreds of years. Um, and what this basically said was that from the moment we got below that sand level, we were in a glacial till, um, which means that we went from early 1900s to 15,000 years in a millimeter. Um, and that was very disappointing because that meant that we didn't find the basement. It also meant that um, this is a profile of that same drawing, which essentially shows multiple layers of um, subsoil. Um, what it meant was that the property did not have that historic uh, basement behind it. Um, we were quite dejected. One of my volunteers actually found a news story that said after they moved the house, they took down the hill. So at that point in 2018, we were convinced that the original Shirley Place foundations were located in that area where we dug, but after the house was moved, that area lost the height of its soil down below the bottom of the foundations and essentially the site was taken away and the site was gone. So that was very um, unfortunate to say the least. So we packed up our bags, we took our artifacts and we washed them, we cataloged them, but essentially we were, we were sad to say that the site was no longer there. And then 4244 Shirley Street came along. <laughs> so um, there had been uh, really for centuries an oral history of this property being um, a place of enslavement related to Shirley Place. Um, when we were digging across the street, we were talking about the fact that this property could have been an outbuilding. It doesn't scream 18th century architecture uh, and it never really was meant to scream anything. It was really just an outbuilding. Um, but then in the summer of um, 2019, actually, I'll, before I talk more about that, I, um, I want to show the location of it. So here's Shirley uh, Place today. We were digging essentially in where these trees are. And then across the street, pretty close to it, but across the street is 4244 Shirley Street. And it's a little bit hard to tell from this photo, but it's got a decent yard. And the house itself is just slightly cockeyed to the grid of the whole property, which really kind of rings an alarm bell for this could be a much older property because it doesn't really relate to the grid that was established in 1860, suggesting that it predates 1860. And the only thing that was there before 1860 was Shirley Place. So um, in addition to that, that map that I, or that drawing that I showed you at the beginning, um, you can very clearly see that there is a small outbuilding on one side of the property. There's another one on the opposite side that's long gone. We're not even going to talk about that one. Um, and then on early plans of the property, you have this long outbuilding with a circular uh, road in front of it, strongly suggesting that this is a carriage house where you would have brought your horse and buggy up to the house, did a loop to drop off all the people that were there to the, for the parties and the owners. And then the enslaved people would drive the carriage over to the carriage house where they would store the uh, carriage. But also the second story would have been living quarters for the folks that um, worked on the property, potentially the people taking care of the horses and the carriage and the drivers, um, but also just generally speaking, housing um, on the second floor. So in summer 2022, um, the current owner of the property filed to demolish this building. And that set off every red flag or every alarm in the historic preservation world, including especially the Shirley Eustis place managers. Um, the property had been considered as a potential landmark. And that meant that um, my team and the historic preservation team of the city of Boston were very much involved in this. So Joe Cornish from the um, Landmarks Commission and I met with the owner in the summer of 2022 and I brought up the fact that we could potentially do archaeology on the site, and he thought it was a very good idea because it meant that when the property sold or whatever happened to it, um, that we would at least know what was there. So it wasn't an unknown. Um, at that point, the property, the demolition had been prevented, um, which was good, but the owner was still planning on renovating the property in order to turn it into housing, uh, which it had been for many, many centuries. Um, let me make sure. Yeah, so this would have been a preemptive dig, essentially, just to get an idea of what was there. So we started, I started getting work on the research. And that's when some of the more interesting things that we hadn't considered when we first did the dig for the main part of the building came up. So just to kind of reiterate some of the landscape layout, we have Eustace Place going up to the building. You have a stable to the north and a mansion to the south. The key thing being that the road approaches the property from the down the middle of the property. Here's the same property in 1855. You see Eustace Place going up to the property. 
you have the long stable on the north, you have the mansion house to the south, and the property cuts, I'm sorry, the road goes right to the middle. And then here we are in an 1873 map. So what has happened at this point is the mansion has been moved to its new location. And it drives me crazy that all these houses are being moved around in the 19th century. You have the Blake House in Dorchester, this house, many other houses. No one took a picture. Cameras are around. Nobody takes a picture of these things. It would have been so interesting. I can't believe that nobody took a picture of these things. Anyway, nobody took a picture of this being moved. And we don't know exactly where the mansion house was. So hey, here Joe, yeah. can I um can I just ask you to bookmark the building that is shown right in front of the mansion? It's a little uh two, duplex with two little uh yes, here? that one. Just everybody bookmark that one in your brains because we think that that might be the other half of 4244. Ooh, that'd be really cool. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Huh. We'll find that next. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> okay, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. Yeah, no, thanks. Oh, I'm glad that's new information. That's really exciting. So um, in this 1873 map, we know the mansion house has been moved and we have what we believe to be the stable. But then as I was looking at it, there was a thing that kind of caught my eye, which I hadn't noticed before. And it's this dotted line here. So looking at the guide to the atlas, I think I have it highlighted here. Wait, oh, there. Um, this is indicating an unimproved road, which I had never noticed before in the research that I had done for the property. If that was used as place, it kind of indicates an old arrangement of the property. But as you can see, that stable used as place mansion pattern really breaks down in this particular image. So to double check what it was looking like, I went and found the 1855 map again, and I overlaid on top of it the 1873 Hopkins map. And you can see that what happens is the two things really line up beautifully. If you look on the right, there's Dorchester Brook, which at this point was turned into essentially a, a Grand Canal. Um, you get the bend in the river, and then the stream to the southern end of it, or I guess western end at this point. Those end overlap really well. And Eustace Place overlaps really well. And so from this, what I believe is happening is we've got, sorry, sorry, stop. Um, you have Eustace Place showing up clear as day. Um, I'm very sorry about that. I thought it was off. Um, and then you have all of the other buildings uh, that were there prior to the move, but the layout is kind of gone. The other, um, sorry, got distracted. This building is 4244. This is the mansion. What it suggests from those maps is that both the mansion house and 4244 were moved because if they hadn't been, then the, um, the carriage house should be located to the north of Eustace Place, which it clearly isn't at this point. So what we wanted to do was, um, when we had the opportunity to dig on the property, was to test a lot of these ideas. So first thing what we did is we entered onto the property um, and we dug in the garden. So what you can see on the right side of the image is 4244 Shirley Street. We are digging just to the west of it in um, what's now a garden. Um, because the idea is that if the carriage house is actually in its original location, if 4244 is in its original location, we're missing half of it. And as Susie said, that other half may have actually been moved across the street to the front of the mansion house. Um, but what should be still in the ground is the foundations of the Western half of 4244. So the first trench that we opened, which we call trench one, was this two meter by half meter trench directly in line with the, where the foundations would have gone. One of the things that we found fairly quickly, which was a big surprise to us, was that in this fill deposit, there was a lot of native creations. So what we have here is a piece of Massachusetts pottery on the top, and at the bottom is a flake, which is a piece of stone that breaks off while making stone tools. We can't date the rock on the bottom because we don't know what tool was being made. However, the pottery at the top um, dates to sometime between 3,000 years and 400 years ago, because that was a time period during which uh, native people were making pottery in the Northeast. The stone could be from an entirely different century, we don't know, or millennia. Um, but the other problem with this particular deposit was that it was a fill deposit, which means the soils have all been disturbed. So we don't have this intact native site, but we have really strong evidence of the presence of native people on the property in this fill deposit. And pottery especially is a really fragile item from that time period. So it was really shocking really to see any turn up on the site. 
The other thing that we found in this first trench was a really important artifact, um, a cowrie shell. So um, cowrie shells would have been a really key um, create, uh, artifact in the enslaved um, communities worldview. Uh, in Western Africa, cowries are used as identity markers, but also as money in some cases. And um, we see them associated with sites of enslavement in America and the colonies. Uh, they're not always indications of enslavement. In fact, we know that they were used in some cases for packaging peanuts, which would have produced a lot of them. However, we have only found cowrie shells on Boston sites where enslaved people were present. So we have a pretty strong correlation. So we were really shocked, excited, and saddened in many ways to find um, a cowrie shell on this particular property. Um, unfortunately, it was in a disturbed context, but uh, it being present on the site was really um, an uh, exciting kind of voice from the past of the enslaved people that would have been on this property. It's backless, which means the back of it has been carefully removed. Um, which would have allowed it to be worn into clothing, worn in hair, but it's also very likely that these were not visible on the people that owned them or with the people that owned them because um, due to uh, the Puritan nature of, of New England, many of the people that were brought over from afar and the indigenous people of the, of the colonies were forced to abandon visibly their uh, traditional practices. So native people and enslaved Africans and free Africans and free native people were oftentimes not able to carry on their culture visibly. And it may have been more of a clandestine object that would have been a personal object, but not necessarily in the view of enslavers. So here you can see trench one in correlation to the property at 4244. So here's the corner of the foundation. If the foundations were to have continued, they would have gone straight through this trench. So not finding any foundations in the trench, we were able to say that we don't believe that the western half of 4244 was located on this property or in its current location, which also supports the fact that, or the idea that 4244 was moved around the same time as the main mansion house onto its current place. Here you can see the profile of that same trench. Um, you can see some layering. You see this dark brown soil at the top. You see this dry soil and the darker soil slightly below. This was um, 2018 was that kind of drought year. So this is basically dust bowl dirt. And the only reason why we have differences in colors from here to here is moisture. Um, but if this was a natural soil, this is four feet down. It's really hard to see in this uh, photo. I have a drawing coming up. Um, if this was a natural soil, we would have run out essentially of of, of cultural material by the first two feet or so. And this is fill going all the way down. We actually had to stop due to OSHA regulations, which means we can't dig beyond four feet without shoring up the walls, um, but it was fill all the way down. That also means that at some point there was a hole there that was at least four feet deep, or it was a low space that was down more than four feet from its current location that had been built up over time. We're not sure still. Here's a profile. It's a really boring profile. You have the surface here, you have an A soil, which is our kind of garden soil, and then this big amorphous fill. It was made up of A, B, and C soils, and that just means that we have topsoil, midsoil, and subsoil all mixed together. So all the dirt that we excavated through was from some other place, churned up, and then dumped onto the site. So from there, we moved into the main yard itself. We started excavating a series of trenches. Um, there's two ways that we really do what's called a phase one. And phase one surveys are really just, is there a site here, yes or no? They're not the big open hole where we're trying to find everything. We're just trying to figure out what's the fastest and most efficient way we can survey the site to answer as many questions as possible and cause as little disturbance to the site as possible. So even though there's, um, it has a nice kind of order to the 90 degrees and everything, essentially what we've been doing is working from known to unknown. So our first trenches are always unknowns. We have no idea what's going to happen. So in this uh, particular trench, you can see at the lower part here, this was the second trench that we opened following trench one. And then from that, we extend outward in a 90 degree direction and just try to see what can we find. And then if we find something that confuses us, we work in another 90 degrees. So we're really chasing the site across the landscape through these trenches and extending them towards unknowns, hoping to kind of maintain a constant tra trajectory of going from a place that we understand 
into a place that we don't understand. And when we see changes, then we know something new is happening. So what does that look like um, overall? So this is what the excavations of 4244 and 2022 looked like. Trench one up here on the side is kind of a standalone in the garden that really just had a one and done purpose of is the extension of 4244 continuing? No, it's not. Trench three, there's a fence here, so we kind of skipped to trench three. That started here, and then we had multiple trenches extending off into all different directions to cover as much of the yard that we could while digging as little as possible. We also had a couple of challenges, which were um, a series of um, utility lines. We had a gas line and a water line cutting right through the middle of both sides of the site. Um, and so we had to kind of work to avoid that because it's not usually um, uh, celebrated when you blow up a site because you broke through the gas line. Um, and it's not great for your volunteers either. This is a map that we created. It's, it's a 90 degree turn. If you turn this map 90 degrees to the right, with north on the right. This is a map of the front yard of 4244. You can see the building here. We created this using our phone. Um, it's just a 3D LIDAR, LiDAR scan of the whole property. And we, we didn't quite kind of know when we did it was that you can actually, when you're done, first of all, turn it in 3D. And I can't do it here in the presentation, unfortunately. But when you rotate it to the top and then zoom up, you create an aerial photograph, which you couldn't have gotten on the ground, or we were able to get it from the ground, but we didn't actually go up in the air, if that makes any sense. So by doing this record, we could kind of zoom up into an area that we couldn't physically go to and see the site from above, which we can't do in real life, but we were able to do with the foam. And you can see a couple of different things happening here. Um, we have a series of trenches, as you know already. We have a series of test pits. You can see one here, you can see one here, and then there's two in the middle here. These are just the little pokes that go down a little bit deeper. You have this really light soil happening down here, and then the very obvious series of cobbles in the top. And we're gonna talk about all of those next. Okay, so in trench three, we first encountered the cobbles. And you can see here that there's a very distinct edge to these things. You have a straight line stone, and then uncobbled in one area, very thoroughly cobbled in the other. Um, this is actually shown up here in the top part of the site. It's the closest to trench one. And what you're actually looking at in this orange soil is intact soils from the native landscape, meaning that that is soil that was deposited by the glacier. Um, it has never been dug into until we got to it. We actually paused at this point because everything below that point would be a native site. And we didn't want to dig into the native site unless we had to. But we were able to establish the edge of the cobbles it also means that the cobbles themselves are not terribly deep uh, into the site, which means that we're really looking at the last story that happened on here in, on this property, um, which to us means that we're looking at something to do with Shirley Place. So the cobbles were a complete surprise. We had no idea they would be there. So we chased those cobbles everywhere. Um, and you can see they're very clearly laid deliberately. There's a there's a track, there's a um, angular track to them. They are perpendicular to our trenches, and that's good. Um, we really wanted to dig our, our trenches were actually deliberately angled 45 degrees to the grid of the site. And that's because what we didn't want to do is, um, well, what we did want to do is cut across things. So if there was a wall, we wanted to cut across it. What we didn't want to do is end up right next to it for 30 feet and miss it entirely for that 30 feet and not realize it was just next to that. But by cutting at it at a 45 degree angle, we were more likely to just cut through features and see them. Um, to be able to find more information. So this is the zoomed in version of that aerial image. And you can see there's a continuous edge to the stone. I think it's safe to extrapolate <laughs> underneath this dirt here that it continues on beyond there. Um, but there's also a clear edge on this side of the stone. And this is uh, um, seven feet across from one edge to the other going down the property. We couldn't dig in this area because it's concrete. So this is a kind of simplified version of our feature plan. We have this cobble pavement that cuts across the site, across the front of 4244. And then we have a gas line that cuts across this way, which caused a whole bunch of problems for our digging because it just was a big hole that we saw everywhere. And then on this side of the property, there was a water line. We also had another, um, uh, I think it was, electric, yeah, it was an electrical line that actually was located right here which we didn't even dig above because that's even more risky than the gas line. The gas line, unfortunately, was not marked by dig safe. So we didn't know it was there until we found it. 
um, ditto for the water line, but the, the electrical line we very clearly knew was there, DigSafe marked it and we avoided it, which is also why you have not as much excavations in that area. So within that kind of crisscrossed area, you saw that lighter soil and you can see it here. This is actually what I think is the most um, important part of the site overall. Uh, it's, it's hard to explain unless you're physically touching it and standing on it, but essentially as we're digging down to these soils, it, you can see in the profile, it's, it's kind of a consistent fine soil. There's not a lot in it. Uh, there's not a lot of rocks. And then it comes down pretty abruptly on this cobbly surface. Um, you can feel it with the trowel as you come down to it because you're kind of digging loose, 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 and it's just firm. And when you're digging down to that surface, it doesn't feel so much like you're digging down. It feels more like you're cleaning off that flat area. And it came down on each one of these trenches at the same depth, but um, relative to itself, meaning that if the trench sloped down, the, the floor was flat. So at that point, we got excited because we're thinking this has to be the basement floor because it's the only reason why you would have this large expanse of firm, compacted, solid surface that was essentially cleanable. Now it's not, um, sometimes we find like compacted surfaces that are like, like perfectly smooth. This is not like that. This is more of like a cobbled surface. It would not be a good thing to walk on regularly. So it suggests to me that this surface may have had a covering at one point, but that covering had been thoroughly pushed down into the soil and compacted that soil and then removed or decomposed. We didn't find any evidence of a brick floor. We didn't find any evidence of a plank floor, um, just this kind of level ground about a foot and a half down. So here's the site from a profile. So that same thing that we can do by going up into the sky with the 3D images, we can actually turn the camera directly to the side and look at the edge of the site as though we were standing in the ground looking sideways, which you can't do in real life. Um, it's it's not the crispest image, but basically what you have on the far left is the cobbled surface. Then you have a completely level surface. And that's the main structure of the basement. And then in this area, it's a little bit more undulating. It's a little bit hard to tell. And then we dug down in our test pits in two areas um, they ended up being really filled with rocks, but also bricks and other um, artifacts from the mid 18th century, which um, we only wanted to test in the very small areas because going into the project, we made a commitment that digging below the floor was essentially minimal, if at all, because in other parts of the world, especially the mid-Atlantic, um, when you have the basements of kitchens, especially where you have enslaved people, there's often uh, ritual practices that happen when people are alone in the kitchen with the uh, with their community about ritual and interment of objects, sometimes even um, deceased members of the family, like children. And what we didn't want to do was to go below that ground because if there was something like a ritual cache of, of, of meaningful creations or meaningful objects or God forbid a burial, we did not want to disturb that. We did choose to do it in one, uh, these two spots here, just to get a tiny little slice to confirm that there was something underneath the floor. What we did find in these two areas was that the site continued down. There was 18th century exclusive artifacts below that surface. Um, and we weren't able to dig past that because there was quite a few rocks in the way, but it never stopped. There's something down there. Um, we don't really know what. I'm sorry, I'm pointing the wrong one. That's the water pipe. <laughs> this is the pit that we dug down deeper to see if there's anything. And as it kind of sloped down, we started to find more bricks in that area as well. Now, um, okay, I'll show this briefly. So that was the main kind of, in this red area. Outside of that red area, we did a couple of other trenches and this is what we found. There's this kind of jumbled fill. It's not terribly well compacted. There's not a lot in it. And then we hit this red soil and red soil in, in New England is symbol uh, signifies what we call B soil. It's a kind of a iron rich soil. B soils are really important because they have, um, they indicate an intact uh, glacial deposit, which means that this is undeveloped Roxbury dirt. Nobody has dug there except us when we dug through it. We dug through it in this one spot, continued all the way down into complete subsoil. This is glacial deposits 20 plus thousand years ago. Um, we could confirm that this portion of the site, which is really the Eastern portion of Fort, the front yard is completely intact, undeveloped. Nobody has put a foundation there ever before. So from that, we've been able to kind of reconstruct three main zones of the property. 
This is where Trench 1 was, which is just west of 4244. And for some reason, we still don't know why, there's at least four feet of fill in that area. It means that it was either already originally much lower and then built up four feet, or someone had dug down four feet and then filled it back up again. We can't tell yet. There's a buried surface here, which is firm, flat, and only a couple of feet down, which has all the hallmarks of the basement. And then just outside of it, in this area here, we have completely natural soils. So from that, we have concluded that this red area in some way represents the original footprint of Shirley Place. We can say with pretty good confidence that we have found the original footprint of Shirley Place. Next question is, okay, so where exactly is it? So from there, we have these four layouts. And this is kind of as close as I'm gonna get to where was the house? It's one of these, I think. So we have a couple of different ideas. One of the biggest things we were debating throughout the entire time we were excavating was, was the cobbles that we found in the house or outside of the house? So if they were in the house, the most likely place that they would have been located was in that piazza. So that place that's not in the basement, but it is just outside of the basement underneath the, um, underneath the kind of covered porch. Why it was cobbled, I'm not sure, but that is a option. So here is the alignment of the property if you put that cobbled surface in the piazza. Option B is that the covered, I'm sorry, the cobbled surface is just outside of the house, which would make a lot of sense because cobbled surfaces are usually put into a place to make the ground more durable and more easy to walk across or ride across if you're in a horse. So if that's just outside of the, um, outside of the piazza, then that puts the house here which is more in the road. So I don't really want that one to be the case because then it's it's there's less of it left. Then there's two other ideas that we have, which is why is 4244 where it is? And why is it kind of cockeyed to the road? So if they moved the house, there would have been a foundation that we've already seen in all the photographs of the original house. They didn't take that with. So if that was the case, why wouldn't they have reused at least some of that for 4244 when they moved it over? If that's the case, then 4244 would be located somewhere on the actual existing foundations of Shirley Place. And this half of the house actually is about the exact width of Shirley Place itself. So if they reused um, the, <laughs> what direction are we going in here? The Southern foundation wall for 4244, then the house would be located in this location. And if they reuse the northern portion of the foundation, then that shifts the house all the way up. So these are our four potential locations of where Shirley Place was um, in the 1740s. And I don't know yet which one that is, but here's some of the other things that supports this, this conclusion of, of one of these four, potentially A. Um, when we did the overlay, we placed 4244 here and the original footprint of Shirley Place is located just in front of the building. And you can see how option A really aligns pretty well with that overlay. Now the overlay is not perfect, but this is a pretty good match. Um, the biggest issue with that idea is the cobbles are actually significantly uh, narrower than the actual width of the piazza. And we can't think of a single good reason why they would only cobble the bottom two thirds of the piazza. It could be that the piazza is actually shallower than we believe, but that's unlikely because the measurements are pretty precise from all of the other measurements. Um, and so this actually maybe suggests that the piazza was, um, this part of the piazza, which has the housekeeping room and the bedroom for the man, may have actually been just south of here. We're still not entirely sure. But with option A, the one thing that was really shocking when we started to align everything was this kind of wider soil, really this corner here that we found really perfectly aligned with the wine cellar's edges um, in a way that was kind of, it felt meaningful, but it may not be. Um, but this is one of the ones that were like, option A checks off the most boxes, although it's still not perfect. But the nice thing is about it is that we can still test it. So here's the thing about all the options is that the historic documentation that we have for the property has two big features. There's a pump, which is another name for a well, and there's the base of, of a chimney, which no matter how much you do to get rid of all those bricks, there's gonna be something left behind. So option A actually places that chimney just outside of where we dug, which is frustrating, but we didn't know it at the time. And it puts our pump 
in the middle of or the corner of one of the, uh, the paved areas. Either way, wherever you place that house, if it's not completely under 4244, which I, I hope it's not, but I don't know yet, what we could do is with additional testing, we could try to see if we can find the pump. If we can find the pump or the footing for the fireplace, especially in this location, which I show here, which is testable because we know exactly what grids where, where to dig. If we find the pump in the in the chimney, it locks the house into an uh, into a precise location, and from that we can extrapolate the entire landscape, which would be really exciting to do. All right, so here's what we know, and they're not conclusive. Conclusive, by the way, this is the key part of all of this is that typically when we're doing archaeology, it's all about the stuff. We get a lot of information out of the artifacts. We didn't find that much on either of these properties, so we're really doing most of our interpretation based on the dirt itself. So we know that there's no evidence of foundations west of 4244, the, the current building. We know that there's a cobbled surface that aligns with the original orientation of 4244 and the Shirley Place. It's a compacted surface that aligns with um, the cobbles and it's shallow. There's an undeveloped soil on the eastern half of 4244 Shirley Street, which I, I believe to mean that there's nothing there um, from buildings wise, at least. Um, our preliminary conclusion is that the mansion was in 4244 Shirley Street. We're not sure exactly where its location is based on what you saw, and that the carriage house was likely relocated to its current position based on all the alignments that we have from some of those old maps. But we still have a ton of questions. Why was trench ones filled? What was what was it filled? Was it filled up? Was it filled, was it dug down and then filled back up? Is it possible that there was a foundation there when they moved the western half of the property, they took the foundation out of the ground and that's why we have this big hole? That's also possible as well. Can we find the pump and chimney? Why are the cobbles narrower than the piazza? Is that because it's not where the piazza is or is there some other reason? Um, what was the floor of the basement? This was a very uneven floor that we found. Doesn't seem like an ideal place to walk. So was there something covering it? Related to that, is this actually the top of a fill that people added to the soil in order to fill in that shallow foundation that if we dug down further, we would actually get down to the real basement of the building. And that this is just a very compacted fill to fill in that low lying area before they built the 40, or before they moved 4244. We don't know because again, we're really concerned about digging down in that area and disturbing potentially um, culturally uh, sensitive areas. Um, related to the next question, and is it even okay to dig in the floor? And that's, I think, a really big question going forward. If this is a potential sacred space to the enslaved people that lived on this property that have ritual interments of, of goods or people even, is it okay for us as archaeologists to dig into it? Or is, or is the best thing that we can do is advocate for it being preserved? And there's many other questions, but those are the key ones. So that's where I'm at now. Um, we're going to have a full report still. It's been slow in the making. Um, but I think this covers just about everything that we know, and I'm going to end with our backfilled units. And I haven't seen it in a little while, but I think it's doing pretty well. I think the grass is really enjoying the uh, aeration that we put into the soil from digging it up. So I'm going to stop sharing, and I would really hope that for those of you still with us, um, have some questions. I see in the chat there's a ton. I don't know if it's about the link, though. <laughs> and I'm happy to stay for a while longer to answer questions. Um, if someone can, oh. Susie, you're on mute. Thank you, sorry, I do that every time. Um, I think we managed to answer most of them uh, while you were talking, but there was one from Archer asking about if the, if the cowrie was found in Phil, um, uh, how do you know that the cowrie comes from that site? What couldn't, and That's he's okay. asking, couldn't Phil come from anywhere? It could be, yeah, absolutely. Um, the thing though is that there's two reasons why we think it's from the site. One, there's not a really good reason to bring a bunch of dirt to the top of this hill and dump it there from somewhere else. Um, and the other thing is that the correlation of the cowrie shells to the ground are two sites where there was, where there was enslavement is pretty one-to-one -one at this point. So, um, it's not a definite, I would be much happier finding that cowrie shell in an intact deposit, because then I can say for certain that the cowrie shell is from this site, it's from the people that were enslaved there. Um, but I, I can't yet, um, but it's a really good suggestion that we are in the right place and that we're, if we find more intact places, which again, we were deliberately avoiding digging into when we encountered them, 
there's a good chance that we'll find more evidence of the story of enslaved people in those places. I see Sarah Burke's question about ground penetrating radar. So the good thing about ground penetrating radar, it's fine whenever. We don't even need to um, do it inside the open trenches. We could potentially do it on the entire property still. And when you slice it, you actually go down by depth. So you can kind of go below the depth of the trenches. The trenches themselves may cause a little bit of fuzziness to the results. Um, the bigger challenge was that we didn't have a lot of time to do this because we weren't what, at the time we weren't very sure what was happening with the property. Now we have a lot more of a slowdown phase for everything um, because there's there's not an imminent development happening. Um, radar is something we can't do in house. We would have to either beg for a free radar or come up with money to pay for it to happen. <laughs> so um, we wanted to kind of move as fast as we could with as little um, little in the way of doing anything. But the radar is still possible. And I think it would be worthy of doing on this property just because um, we would potentially have other things to look look at and look for based on the radar results. Archer? And you're muted still. I know. I was looking for the unmute. Um, several times you said, find the pump. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you mean by the pump? Or are you saying find the well? It's the well. So the pump is labeled on the map. Right. What's implied is that there's a well under it. Right. But what you're looking for at this point is the well. Definitely. Okay. Yeah. And they're a little dangerous to dig around because what you hope is that they're filled and they're not always filled. And the last thing you want to do is open a trap door under yourself while you're excavating and one of your volunteers disappear. I've um, done that building a building a library in Nicaragua and, and, and fell into a 13 foot um, um, waste hole. <laughs> yeah. It's, um it's one of my worst fears, literally. Uh, and they can be quite deep, especially on hills. So the, the well that was dug for the state house on top of Beacon Hill is a hundred feet deep. And I would not want to be the one building that first of all. And I certainly wouldn't want to be the one falling into it. I think I saw a question um, from Tony about a future dig. Um, at the at this moment, there is no digs planned on the future. So there's two big questions that we really want to answer at this point, which is should we dig more and why would we want to dig more? So um, I think that there's a lot of good reason to find out more answers to these questions. I'm not sure if we know if we have a good reason to dig down deeper. I can see us digging wider, but I don't know about deeper. And I would really want to feel that the um, descendant community of the folks who were enslaved on this property um, really had a moment to consider that question and give us some ideas about whether or not they feel comfortable with this being potentially disturbed or dug into. And if we were going to do that, what steps we would have to take um, to do that the right way. Uh, same thing that we do with native sites. Um, there's a right way and a wrong way. And sometimes the right way is to not do anything. So that may be an option as well, or maybe the best option in this particular case. But all the dirt that we removed from these trenches, except for the one spot that we dug down a little bit deeper, that was all dirt that was in that property after 1860. The only thing that we really found in the dirt was from, uh, was mixed, but all that mixing, if there was something older in the artifacts, and there's very few artifacts overall, we only found about 1900 artifacts in this entire dig, which is essentially nothing. Um, if we found anything that was from the 18th century, it was with things from the 19th century. So it really shows us that we were always in the 19th century deposit, which is exactly what we'd want to see for an area that was filled in after 1867. The good news about this property is that it's protected in many ways. It's protected by being landmarked, which means that at all times it will have a review by archeologists, me, um, but also it means that we um, and because the um, because the um, sorry uh, because the property is now owned by Shirley Uses House, a Shirley Uses House Association, um, which purchased it recently, because of that, there's really no real threat to it. There's nothing really planned. It's not going to be torn down. It's not going to be radically changed. Um, and all the decision making going forward on the property, we can do together as far as what the ground does. Um, I can be an advisor to the project going forward as a city staff person. Um, I'm kind of a free resource to the world, or at least to Boston, uh, to the Boston world. And 
Um, if there's ever a need for property changes on the property or for more archaeology, this being owned by a nonprofit, we'd be able to come in and do the dig. So it's really a great situation to have this property be in this kind of protected, owned by a really responsible owner who is interested in preserving this history and celebrating this history and, and kind of into terms to the um, with the history, because um, it's a lot of hard history on this particular property. Can I tell from the minerals in the soil if there are more underneath? Uh, we didn't do that kind of level of analysis. Um, the compactness of it really makes me think that we're de we're dealing with a, 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 a compacted subsoil, but I'm not 100% certain because just beside it, we have a brown kind of reddish soil, and this feels more like a glacial subsoil with the cobbles in it. So I, I don't know. I don't really know what it is. Um, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if we dug down through that surface that we would come down on another surface. And what we've been seeing is kind of fill to bring it up to level after they move the house. Um, but for now, it's it's a little bit too sensitive to dig down into that without knowing more. Radar could potentially tell us. We can do a, a radar survey down through all those layers and it could actually show another surface below the current one that we could hit. In that case, we may be able to suggest that that's actually the original basement. And maybe at that point, we'll see a lot more things than we have been able to see with this kind of rocky surface, which doesn't really have anything in it or on it. Um, but that's down the road. You commented that you found a deposit of bricks below the basement level at one point in one of your, let's shall we say, test holes. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance that that's... Um, chimney it wasn't laying flat they were kind of both at an angle and so it's either the lining of something that kind of had a curved base or it's just a jumbled brick fall um it could be the what we call the uh the chimney fall which is where the chimney quite literally falls we're very technical in all of our archaeological terms um and the bricks kind of scattered given that this property was basically cleaned off when it was being re uh, revamped as a as a development i don't think that they left a lot of mess so I'd be really surprised if there was a chimney fall in the property. Um, I think it's more likely that it's a fill deposit that filled in an area and bricks were included with that. But I don't know, again, if it's a hole that was that I don't know if they're filling up an area that was already down or if they dug a hole and then filled it back up again. It's really hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, another big kind of hole that we're really confused by, it's a little bit hard to see, but um, Immediately behind 4244 is a dramatic drop off. Yeah. If you look at the map, that would have meant that 4244 was actually not only behind um, where we are, but down maybe like 10, 15 feet. And so even though you have this kind of uh, carriage house, road, main house landscape that looks very flat, it may actually be that the that the carriage house is significantly lower in the landscape topographically then the, the mansion house may have been essentially up on a hill and the carriage house down below and so you would come up to the mansion house and then kind of go down a hill but up from above it just looks like they're next to each other um or again they terraced the area in the 1860s this was a time period when everybody was very comfortable moving a lot of land and in many ways they've actually cut through the hill that was located in front of the house as well yes yeah, susie i have a um, couple questions about that so i wonder um i know that Occasionally when they're building these estates and they're building these stables, and, and one of the reasons that this is very interesting, this building, is because uh, as far as we can tell, it's one of the earliest surviving stables in New England. And it's very possible that this is a building that housed really not, not a coach because, because the, the, the pattern, the form of the coach house slash stable is actually a later development. Mm -hmm. So this may be just a stable and the coach is stored in a separate building. But I know, I've know i noticed looking, you know, trying to puzzle this out, looking at other plans. Occasionally these buildings are built on grade. It, do you think that's a possibility here? And that might help account for the, you know, for the change in, change in uh, topography there? It's possible. I'd have to look at the artifacts in Trench 1 again to see if, What's the what's the youngest thing that we found at the deepest part of trench one? Okay. That'll also tell us when the bottom of the trench is. So if the bottom of it contains 19th century deposits, then we know that it was filled up after then. But if it's only 18th century things at the bottom of that, then they built it up in the 18th century to potentially either make a new grade. Okay. Um, but uh, it's entirely possible. The only thing that I, I'm not sure about is 
it, the pudding stone is everywhere. And it was just so easy to build foundations in this area. I just, I have not seen any earth fast structures at all in Boston. It's not that it never happens, uh, but even, even, um, well, it's much later, but all the carriage houses that I've surveyed in Boston, the one I'm thinking of is Dorchester Industrial School for Girls. It had a four or five foot foundation underneath it as well. Okay. Um, again, it's not impossible, but it, it just doesn't seem like they would have needed to skip that step. Okay. And uh, are there ways to to sort of chemically uh, or, mo or molecularly date things like that uh, cowrie shell? Or is that too recent in history? I think the shells are particularly a problem for dating because, and I, I may be wrong on this, but I believe I, I did a, something like this a couple, uh, like a decade ago, but the shell wow. is pulling in calcium carbonate from the ocean and it's creating essentially a shell from really old carbon. Okay. And right. I think the dates aren't quite accurate for when the shell was made. It's really more when the carbon was made. And that doesn't work as well with shells as like a tree because it's pulling the carbon right at that moment. Because it could be, then the carbon could be of any. Yeah, you end up with like a molecular 50 age. Shell. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I have one last kind of complicated question. So one of the things that's always puzzled me about the house and the piazzas is, um, and this may be a, a lack in my architectural knowledge, but as, and Gary Tondorf Dick, who's sitting in the meeting or was here a minute ago, might be able to clarify this. But as I understand it, the piazzas really, you don't really see piazzas in early 18th century houses. And so one of the things I've always wondered is if those piazzas are a later addition because because later owners after the Revolutionary War do a lot of remodeling to the house and possibly even to the carriage house or to the stable as well. And, and I, I've puzzled whether those piazzas, because they're very fashionable in the early 19th century, whether those could be a later addition um, because you just don't see them in these, at least I have never seen them in early 18th century Georgian structures um and could that that would certainly complicate i would think the whole picture and gary i don't know do you want to do you want to weigh in on that don't forget to unmute unmute gary unmute there you go am i good yeah yeah i would agree i would agree suzanne i think the uh um in the earlier 18th century you know the massing of the building was more uh, you know, it had the, it's, it's very simple. You didn't have that kind of outdoor room, that outdoor kind of expression on the, on the building. Like you'd see it later. Right. You, you often have, in a lot of these estates, you had these wings, but the wings are enclosed, you know. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 Looking at the 1860 photo right before the move, I'm seeing two things. Um, the windows are the same, but that doesn't mean that they weren't adding newer windows. Right. Yeah. I noticed that too. But the piazza foundation is brick. So it's entirely possible that you could have in addition to the house with that foundation that would be more or less irrelevant to the foundation work that was previous. So like what I was looking for was, is the stonework continuous or does yeah. it like break very clearly? A there? dividing line, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's it's pretty abrupt because it's a totally different material at the corner um that's a really interesting idea so in that case you would have the cobbles could have been later under the piazza but not intentionally under the piazza when they were being built they were essentially around the house creating a kind of walkway around the house that when the piazza was extended above or beyond the property it covered up the cobbles um yeah that's entirely possible it would at least explain why if that, if that the option A is the accurate option. And again, if we found the well done, we know where it is. Um, that would at least explain why the cobbles are irrelevant to the width of the piazza because it wasn't really part of it to begin with. That's a really good idea. All right. Is there so also a date when the um, when the ballast on the ships was more more cobble and less brick, or or when brick became more the the uh, the systematic kind of ballast. Um, to be honest, I didn't think it went to brick. I thought it was always um, chert or flint. Um, I don't know to be answer you to be really honest. Um, yeah, I think there's some controversy about the whole brick ballast uh, question. Okay. I would say that right. the, the seaport shipwreck that we found from the 1860s was rounded beach cobbles as ballast. Oh. 
but that's like a century later. So mm -hmm. um, I saw a question from Lisa. Um, do we know where the shell would have come from? So naturally the shells occur in the Indian Ocean and the Eastern um, or in the Pacific Ocean and Indian Ocean. So um, it's most likely that the shell actually originated from the East Coast of Africa. So I'm not, I, I should have looked this up before. I'm not 100% certain that they don't show up on the West Coast of Africa, but I believe that they are Pacific Indian Ocean specific. They are, and they get and, traded across Africa. Yeah. That's so they my understanding. Like trade good from the get go. And then they would have come over from Western Africa to America, having already gone across Africa. Um, so they've had a long journey. Um, which means they passed through multiple hands before they even got to West Africa. Um, the question from Anne about the pottery and the flake. So the um, the flake, I, I should have, let me just see if I can pull up a photo of that real fast. Um, we can do that with the stone. I did not do that yet with these because we're still in the analysis part, which is really just me trying to get the time to write this all up. Um, but about the pottery, it's difficult to, to locate the pottery clay source because the deposits are so enormous. Um, there's a clay deposit that essentially stretches from Canada down to Boston called the Perzumscot Formation or the Boston Blue Clay you might have heard of. Um, and that is the source of all the clay that people use for pottery from indigenous all the way to potter still using it for bricks and, and pottery today. Um, and more or less, it all has the same chemical signature, top to bottom. Not not quite, but like essentially, it's the same. It would be able to we would be able to differentiate it between the clay here and say the clay um, in the Piedmont of Virginia because it's a fundamentally different origin. That's an erosional clay, and this is a glacial deposit clay here. Um, but within that region, it's almost impossible to do. Um, looking at the flake, I need to see it in person, but it looks like it's a Mattapan banded, which is um, a rock that's found only in Mattapan. Um, the most frequently uh, materials that we've been seeing in rock spear, Mattapan banded, um, a little bit of Blue Hills rhyolite, but essentially it's a local material. It's not being traded very far. Uh, so while we're waiting for a few more questions, I just want to let folks know that we are we are currently working to find funding for uh, for continued research on this uh, building and the site because we 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 we're also sort of working on a visioning plan about kind of what we want to do in the future. But our our primary goal right now is to just continue to do research because there's so much more to be learned in terms of documentary evidence about the people enslaved at Shirley Place. We know that there are records from the Shirley family in the Huntington Library in California. There's material in England. Um, so there's a lot more to be done to help fill that story in, if possible, from the documentary side. And then there's a lot more to be done in just looking at the building itself uh, and understanding its uh, history and structure in terms of what was added, what was removed, you know, what was done when. Uh, so, so there's a lot more to do. And Joe's contribution is really filling in just a, a lot of that essential information that we will be sharing with other people, you know, as we continue to research the building and the many different kinds of expertise that can be brought to bear on better understanding a building of sort of this uh, unusual structure and history and use. Uh, and so if anybody has more questions about that, just you know, feel free to reach out to us at the at the Shirley Eustace House, and of course, um, you know, <laughs> all of this costs money, a lot, a lot of money. And so, if you uh, have an extra five bucks in your pocket that you are willing to donate, or an extra five hundred, um, do do uh, reach out. Uh, you can make a donation on our website, or write a check, or give us a call, and we can talk about other things. And I am sorry to you know, sort of wrap this up with a plea for funds, but such such as it is in, in the world of nonprofits. Um, anyway, just wanted to put that commercial break in before we go on with any more questions. Uh, and we are thankful to Joe for sticking with us uh, beyond the sort of official end time for this really great conversation. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, Joe, uh, I'm sure you're aware of it. I mean, there is a woodcut, I think, or an engraving from the 1850s, I think, uh, which shows the house and the barn to the left. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm allowed to share my screen, I think I can show it. Um, 
Um, nope, I can't. Right. Uh, but right. anyway, um, I, I wonder whether you would, because it seems to show the barn at the same, uh, the stable at the same level as the house. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm aware I'm talking of about? it. I trust the photo more than a drawing, but um, yeah. the other one that confuses me is in the 1860s image. It's it's far enough away from the house that we shouldn't see it, but there should be some more visible evidence that there's a house just off to the left of the image, and I don't see that, and I also don't see a slope that goes away from it either. So there's there seems to be like enough evidence to say that it's level with the house, but there's not the photographic backing it up. Um, the painting of or the the etching from the 1770s, the one in my title screen, they very much show a level property, and um, it's just it's I I yeah I don't maybe <laughs> yeah um, yeah you know I mean, what yeah. oh yeah. sorry go ahead. oh go ahead oh the the picture from Drake uh from Francis Drake's 18 something history of Roxbury actually kind of shows there it's a it's another sort of artistic rendering, but it kind of shows it, it that might be a that might be an accurate, more more or less accurate picture of the geography of it, because it's kind of tucked away in the back. Um and it also kind of the way it's depicted, it's it shows it sort of from Dudley Street that it's a it's kind of a long, low building at that time. Um I can share that with you after the fact. Yeah. If you don't have it already in your I don't slides yeah i mean the part that confuses me the most is like the if they cut away all of that land behind what's now 42 44 it's a very dramatic drop um, yeah the basement of the garage like thing behind 42 44 is entirely daylit on the back side of it and it's easily six to seven feet tall so um, it's a significant drop. And um, I, I think it's more likely to deal with the terracing when they're trying to create these house lots so that nobody had like a really sloped yard. But it's still a, such a significant drop that I feel like that really does suggest that there was a pretty decent lower landform um, behind the house than it is today, but not quite as low as it is today. Um, it's a really vague answer, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to throw out a couple of answers from the questions I saw. Um, the cellar documents are actually from an oral history of the house, um, reconstructing the basement layout from essentially stories of people that saw it before it moved. Um, we have started using AI in our work, but it's been predominantly through, there was a question about AI. Um, uh, it's predominantly through transcription. We can throw old documents at chat and GPT and ask them to spit back out transcriptions. And it's a lot faster correcting those than it is um, doing it from scratch, although it's not 100% accurate. And as you do it, uh, chat starts to actually learn how to read cursive better, which is really creepy, but also helpful. Um, and then uh, somebody asked about the porches, if they were lost during the move. Yeah, the porches did not make the move at all. Um, so they're probably the shortest lived aspect of the architecture of the property overall. Yeah, Nina. Like they put together the street grid with all the houses and everything, but I'm I'm just a little curious, like if there was only one house there, why did they decide to set it up so they had to move it? I think they weren't setting it up to move it. I think they were setting it up to demolish it. So it was kind of like, a, what's the way to make the best layout for the new houses? And I didn't have a, a thorough research in my in my permit to go back to, but I, I know that there's better research about what went into protecting the house that first go around. Um, and maybe Susie can talk more about that, but I don't think it was the original plan to move the house. I think it was more of a, um, a secondary thought and, um, I'm glad they did move in, but uh, that's why the that's why the road was just going to go wherever it went essentially. But I think it was more of evenly dividing up the overall estate with the housing uh, with the housing lots and the road lots, and less about you know how to avoid you know you want to have that curve like it just shouldn't be that difficult. But um, <laughs> right. 
The other thing it's is cheaper to get to the water or something. I don't know. Yeah. They also cheaper to make a straight forward. street than it is. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that the hill in front of 4244 drops off pretty dramatically. So I think originally the road would have gone or the, the landscape would have gone more or less flat across the front of 42 and then plummeted down to the lower part of, of Shirley Street. But nowadays you kind of feel this kind of more grad. It's still a pretty big hill, but a gradual slope that cuts into the front yard of 42. I didn't have I have more images of it, but um, the presentation was getting really long. But you can really see how the landscape of the yard and the landscape of the road are really pretty irrelevant to each other today. Um, they did a lot of landscape modification in that 1860s time period. Susie, you're gonna Oh, just because the, the guy who, firstly, they turned it over the property to, uh, they subdivided it, right? They wanted to make the most profit they could uh, in the 1860s. So, of course, it's it's cheaper to lay out straight streets, uh, and you can subdivide it into more and more so lots uh, if you do that rather than, you know, curves. And so that that maximizes your profit. Um, but I guess the guy who who started it all was a sort of a kind of a, earlier proto-preservationist, I'm forgetting his name, W.E. Woodward, I think. Um, and so it's to him that we owe, he, he's the one who uh, pick, picked the house up and moved it to the existing lot and then just turned around it and sold it to somebody else. Um, but the other thing too, is that a house like that is, uh, sometimes it's more expensive to tear it down in those days than it is to just pick it up and move it. People moved buildings all the time. Uh, and, and a house like that is, it's put like a tank and it's a lot of work to tear it down. And all the stuff in England was also like straight streets. I mean, right. I mean, I'm in the South End, but if you even go to the original parts off of Washington, they're they're straight streets. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The original roads of Boston were native trails, and so it's kind of stuck for a while. But by the 19th century, they were pretty much over that, and were very much straightening everything out. Yeah. Yeah, the, when I was doing uh, research for my buildings book, um, I was really trying to nail down some of the move dates on some of these properties. And I was blown away when you go into the city records for the permits to move a house. They're mm -hmm. so flippant about it. And there's dozens a year that are being moved. Um, they don't even mention where it's coming from. They're just like, I got to move a house. Can I get a permit? It's like, it's a it's an afterthought. And I think it's insane that people didn't take pictures or record these things, but it would have been like trying to record the number of times you see, I don't know, an expensive car on the street. Like it happens enough times that you're not going to document every instance. And um, you might mention that you saw something a couple of weeks ago, but it's not going to be like the the headline news for that day. But this would have been one heck of a house to move. I mean, my goodness. <laughs> And it was already off the ground and like on stilts from such an early time period that you basically had to keep it on stilts, lower out the basement, and then still move it while still lifted, either down, lower it down and then move it and lift it back up again, or just kind of try to carry it over as much as you can while still being lifted up. There was a lot of incredible engineering to get this thing yeah. maybe, what, 150 feet across the street. But labor was very cheap back then. Um for many terrible reasons, um, but it was very cheap back then. Uh, Peter Bennis in his book about meeting houses of New England has really great descriptions of the churches were moved very frequently too. And sometimes churches were cut in half when a congregation couldn't decide who would get, you know, the church. So they would cut the church in half and you'd go to the, all the neighbors and, and rent their team of oxen for the day or for the two or three days it was going to take to move it. And so sometimes you had, you know, uh, 12 or 13 teams of oxen, which means 26 26 oxen, you know, dragging these buildings on these rollers. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it seems in amazing to us, but uh, very much sort of all in a day's work in those days, apparently. <laughs> now it takes five years to do anything. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> five, five is just the permitting. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If there are no more questions, we will say thank you to Joe and I will thank everybody for attending. Uh, and uh, we will certainly share more when we know more. Uh, and bless you, Joe, for all the work you've done on all this. It's it's absolutely wonderful. Thanks. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you all for coming and staying for so late. 
Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> Joe, I will set up a, a time to meet with you uh, in the next uh, few weeks because I have I, I I I have many more questions, okay, but I won't yeah. take too much of your time. Hi, Gary. Nice to see you. Thanks for joining nice us. Nice to see you too, Susie. Very nice. Thank you. I, uh, I'm glad I was able to get on. I didn't see the link earlier, but I'm glad I was able to find it and get on. Oh, good, good, good. Yes, you were a help. Great conversation. Excellent. Good night, Thank everybody. You. Good night. Good night.